I'm so happy to have Leslie Satcher here today. I know it's funny, we gotta wear masks. It's but horrible. Yeah, it's Go not ahead. fun. But what can you do? We're in a pandemic, we gotta do it. Um, so, we are here, I'm very excited about this. It's gonna be fun. I love hydrangeas. Me too. Do you? I do. They're they my grandma. Beautiful. They were in my wedding. Were they really? Yes. Oh, I love them. Okay, so hydrangeas can come like totally round and more conical and things like this. These are kind of in between, right? Mm -hmm. Little. These are kind of limelight, I think. Yes, I think they are limelight. They've got that greenish mm -hmm. tone. So speaking of that, you brought up a good topic. Um, you can just get a piece of paper and cut a little hole in it and you can hold it up to things to really understand what the color is. See how like you might think that looks pretty kind of creamish or whatever and then you put a piece of white paper up against it or look through a viewfinder and you can see the different tones against the white. Mm -hmm. So that being said that helps you when you go to lay out your colors which we'll get to in a minute. But before we do that um, we have pictures of all these hydrangeas that I took and the picture that it's in and all that and they'll be on the description below. We'll have that and or on my website right. if you want to download it. But um, And we'll also include them in this video for you to look at. But Leslie and I were talking about it and sometimes if you go to paint and part of the the vase itself is being covered over with the leaves and you can't really see what's happening. It's hard to get your shape of your picture in. So my suggestion is kind of block in your shapes and get your picture drawn in first and then that way you can overlap with leaves and, and whatnot. So we'll have that and um, online for you to uh, download if you want to see that because it's real hard to see the picture. That was good that you took separate pictures Rachel. Like yeah. you, so then the, you would be able to do that. Yeah and I think whenever you're painting something especially flowers you know get get detail shots so that you you think you'll remember all these things about the flowers but like look at that detail shot. Isn't that pretty? Mm -hmm, it is. Then you would say oh yeah these hydrangeas are basically a collection of a bunch of little four-leaf flowers put together. Mm -hmm. So, study your subject, know what you're about to paint, and then we get to the fun part. I have videos already online that talk about toning your, your canvas. And so I won't go into all that again, but basically it knocks out the white and gives you a middle tone to start with and a beautiful color to bounce off of and have a background. It just does it's, a lot. It's a lot more inspiring than just painting on a white canvas. Right? Mm -hmm. I know. I think so too. And it bleeds through. So yes. it helps your colors. Yeah. And it gives you a middle tone. Yeah. So then you could just go lights and dark. So mm -hmm. let's say if we wanted to do an en entirely purple painting, for example, we've got the middle tone. We could go light purple and really dark purple. We can do the whole painting real quick just with lights and darks if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I want to add color to it. That's one thing I really learned from you, Rachel, because as a rookie painter, I didn't know to tone a canvas. I had taken some art classes, but they never said that. And once I started doing that in Rachel's classes, it is amazing how much the level it takes your paintings to. It really does. It, it lifts it to a different place. I know, and it helps you move quicker. Yeah, it does. So, um, okay, we each have some vine charcoal over here. Yes, ma'am. And it's very soft, and if you haven't used vine charcoal, I just love it for drawing in things because, look, you can redraw, you can do things, make marks, and then a paper towel, and boop, you know, there it's gone. So you can really work, and, and don't worry about the charcoal mixing in with your paints either because it just is not a nice little right. gray, actually. It doesn't hurt anything. So Leslie, I went ahead and started blocking this in and mm -hmm. I know you already know how to do all that so I'm going to let you do that and I'm going to talk to them about blocking in. Perfect. But in the meantime, while she's drawing, I'm also going to lay out the colors here. We're going to share a piece of palette paper here and the colors I'm going to use, again, they'll be listed. I've got some golden heavy body raw umber. I'm going to put that out some titanium white. We've got 
Well, let me explain what this is. I've already put this out. This is Fluid Gel Medium by Golden. And it extends your paint and also helps you with glazing. It helps keep the paintings moist and workable a little longer, you know, because acrylics will dry on you. All right, this is a cadmium yellow medium. So it's a nice warm yellow. And then I've got a Hansa yellow, which is warm, but it, it's got a little cooler, a higher chroma to it. Then I'm gonna lay out a little blue. This is a basic palette layout. I've got a warm and cool of each primary color. And that's sort of what I like to do is have ultramarine blue, that's a nice warm blue, and then we have a cool blue with the phthalo, okay? Again, don't worry about all these titles. I'll have the list here for you. And as far as reds, we have a cool red of the quinacridone magenta. These are all golden heavy body. And I don't even know if we're using reds today, but I'm just going to go ahead and lay it out. We've got the cadmium red medium, and you can see it's a much warmer tone than the, the cool red. And you know what, for fun and giggles, I'm going to throw out one of Leslie's favorite colors, mm -hmm. dioxine Love purple. It. And we could make the purple with red and blue, but we could. I'm being lazy. I like alizarin crimson too. I do too. It's beautiful. You can never go wrong with that. Nope. And it's funny how you get your favorite colors, mm -hmm. don't you? you and you get used to how they mix with other colors. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to throw on some gloves just because I'm the messiest painter in the world, I think. And um, with acrylics, you don't really have to worry about safety that much with getting it on your hands, but I still think it's best not to have it if you can do that. And then, um, so we talked about blocking in. I've got my paper towels. By the way, I have some palette knives here to mix some colors. So when we talk about blocking in, I'm not painting. There wasn't enough room for me to do this one on the bottom. Are you doing the one bottom? Yep. I did. I you put them did. in. Oh, that's beautiful. She's got a great layout. You're going to love this. But I didn't. I just am going to focus on these. So that's an artist's prerogative. We just take what we want and leave the rest. Um, now, I know we've done this in class a lot, and it's one of my favorite things to do is to start off monochromatically, like with raw and burn white and mm -hmm. do all that. We could start that way, or we can... And that's kind of what I was doing here, and then I jumped right into color. So mm -hmm. um, I'm going to show them just a little bit of that, and then, but you can feel free to mix your colors as, as you'd like. Okay. And, and feel free to come on over if you're too scrunched okay. over there. Um, Let's see. Okay, and I'm going to just mix up some to share, too. Okay. And you know what? The titanium white. I didn't get enough. What's this middle one here? That's a raw umber. Raw umber, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. I might just get a little bit over here. And I'm going to, since we're working on a palette, I'm going to spritz these to keep them a little moist. And like I said, if we add the gel medium to it, it'll help. I'll just add a little gel medium to this to keep it wetter a little longer. So I'm mixing up like a light raw umber. Let's get some more out of here. Let me have some right here, Rachel. Mm -hmm. You can't have too much raw umber. No. It's a it. dream color. It really makes life easier. I've done whole paintings in it and loved it and then wouldn't go back over and put the color in. Yeah. I'm like, I'm keeping that. Right. I did a video on that where you glaze it. You know, you do. we did the whole pair monochromatically and then glazed over it. Mm -hmm. So pretty. Great process. Okay, so I've made... We have the white, the dark raw umber, some medium, and some light. And um, let's talk about our materials today. We are using Dynasty brushes. All these are Dynasty. I've got a whole bunch of um, different ones here, different shapes, rounds, flats, filberts, angle brushes. Angle brushes are my new favorite thing. How they I are? You? I love them. She's cheating on filberts. <laughs> That used to be always her favorite, <laughs> Filbert. Now she's cheating on Filbert. I'm cheating on Filbert with angle, with an angle brush. But they are great. And see what COVID has done to her. <laughs> I have a new thing too. I don't see it up here. I'm gonna have to go look for it in a minute. Um, Rachel. Oh, here it is. 
dagger brushes. These are great too, and hmm. especially for creating those. leaves because they do this wonderful mark making. Like one stroke thing. One stroke thing, mm -hmm. exactly. So feel free to use any of these. And um, in the meantime, I'm for this going to have like a little angle brush. Again, I'll have all the details. I'm not going to go into the numbers and all that stuff of what the brushes are, but basically a flat, a round, a few filberts, and that's about it. That's all you need. You don't need that much. Um, I've got a few liner brushes, little skinny ones if ever we get to, to details. In the meantime, so what I would do is maybe dip my we have two things of water here. One is for clean and one is for mixing your, your dirty. And it's important to keep your water pretty clean with acrylics, unless you don't care. You could get pretty muddy. All right, yours is coming along. Well, I like your palette knife. Yeah, palette oh, knife's great. So I kind of blocked in, I was doing the shapes of this and just looking at even though it's primarily a whitish tone there's there's a light source coming from here coming from that direction and then it's darker at the bottom and then lighter on this side where the lights hitting it so when I block in I just want to do something that's indicating where the light source is coming from and kind of get that information in and if you wanted to you could even go a lot lighter and block in because like we talked about here's our middle tone already so we've got middle dark and then we could throw in a few lights and they might be thinking well that doesn't look like a hydrangea but that doesn't matter because we're just blocking in shapes and I think that's where people go wrong Leslie they think they're supposed to have all the details first well, I mean, if, it, and, and it, it's, we're not painting hyper-realistic things either. No. You're, I mean, if you're trying to, that's where people get off. That's where I have always gotten off in the weeds. I'm like trying to be too precise right at the beginning. And what makes Rachel's paintings so amazing are that they're so loose in the beginning. And you see this really impressionistic vibe. And then she goes back and puts real details into them. But just in the beginning, just, just making it just fun, just loosening it up. And you could stay that way. You could stay super loose. Mm -hmm. It's all a matter of style totally. and choice. Um, but I think it's really important to use a big brush because that will keep you loose too. Or a palette knife like Leslie's doing hers with a palette knife. And that gives you a lot of texture and unusual shapes that you might not have It keeps me from do. being too precious. Yeah. Yeah. That's important. Oh, before I continue on, I want to show them something. What did I do with it? This is um, a Masterson palette, and this is going to be part of the raffle. Not my used one, but a new one. And we've got our acrylics on this palette paper. They're going to dry pretty fast, so we're working pretty fast and spritzing it. But, miracle of miracles, someone invented this. You get palette paper, and you soak a sponge underneath, and soak the paper, and it will keep these paints wet for... Good grief. Months. Two weeks. Months. Months? Mm. I've never done it for months. I have. They keep a long time. Yeah, and um, you know, if you want to re-spritz it every now and then you can. But it's amazing. So you won't you could use it to store your acrylics and then mix on a palette if you want. Or you can just mix them right here on the palette paper. And they sell, you know, palette paper that's just for this. So that's fun. So if we need more paints, we're gonna here. Okay. Um, I love that Masterson thing. That also was a game changer. Yeah, no, it's those little things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a game changer. <laughs> okay, so we were blocking in and kind of figuring out palette too. Um, I'm seeing a lot of greens, like we talked about. These are limelight hydrangeas. They've got a lot of green in them. They're your painting. You could go any direction you wanted. If you wanted to be blue and white, you could do that. But since I am seeing the green and white, I'm just going to go ahead and mix up a little green. Like I'm going to take a little phthalo and a little bit of this Hansi yellow. That'll be real bright chroma. And chroma is like the intensity. So you can see it's like, it's real loud. 
So to tone that down, you can grab some of your raw umber over here and mix it in with that green. And now it's dulled it down to kind of a brownish green. And I'm going to add a little white to that. And there's that color green. So then we can take what's on your brush and mix a little yellow with it. So this is how I do things. I don't know how you do it, Leslie, but I just keep kind of making me. piles. I do what she tells me to do <laughs> sometimes. Rarely, I was going to say. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I have to follow my muse. <laughs> Uh, I just want to know, mm -hmm. does this, how does this relate to writing music? Is there any kind oh, of uh, It's a giant stress reliever, and if you're not um, can trying to figure out what rhymes with pitcher and hydrangea, <laughs> that's really nice. <laughs> so that's a wonderful thing there. But it is a very, um, it's like takes you, it's a creative part that a lot, I know a lot of musicians who are painters, Yeah. and they all say it's literally like switching to another part of your brain. Um, we know accountants who are painters, a lawyer in one of your last classes, a oh, painter. Yeah. And those, it just switches your brain into a think about this lane and, and everything else kind of just disappears. Right. And in these times, don't we need that? Absolutely. But I mean, as far as a creative process, I mean, you're thinking about color, shape, line. Is there any correlation to writing words? Mm, some. I mean, you know, colors have relationships that look better together. There are words that sound better together. And so that's, I guess that would be kind of a, a, a relation. And also music has a, music sets a mood, certain mm -hmm. certain types of music. I mean, if you're listening to Alison Krauss, that's a lot different than listening to Led Zeppelin. Now those two, as you found out, can blend together, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Robert Plant and Alison Krauss, they made a great team. Right. But Alison Krauss's music and Led Zeppelin's music is completely different, you know. Right. You might listen to one on a Friday night when you're chilling out and one on Saturday evening when you're rocking out. Right. You know? So that's it's just, true. it sets a mood. Right. And paintings set a mood. Right. I think. Right. And I was thinking too, you know, there's these things called the um, principles of art and elements of design, like texture, line, shape, space, negative space, things like that, that are involved in paintings. And I was listening to music, a song the other day, probably cool. one of your beautiful you know, compositions. So. I hope so. And um, uh, there was a negative space, you know, a pause where it gives you a break until the next mm -hmm. thing happens. And I was thinking, that's what I love about it, because th with art, you need those breaks, too. You need to have a little you do. space to breathe and like let the colors have a rest. So I threw in this gr lime green just for fun, just to see what it does against the purple. Look what that does. I love that. Zzz. And then, there's, <laughs> um, speaking of elements and design, there's a thing called unity, which is part of a art theory and that is if you have the color on your brush um, you know sometimes it's good while you've got it on your brush to just throw it around in your canvas different places you may end up covering up most of it but maybe just a little will show and it'll be subtle but somebody will look at that painting and then they don't know why but all the colors are unified somehow and that is how unity works too you can kind of make the colors all speak together and the impressionists of course were pros at that right they those guys understood what what colors would make other colors sing yes they did and i've couldn't. tried to figure that out just by reading about what they did and and how they just turned the art art world on its ear when they figured that out because the the great masters i mean they had, their approach was so different that these guys when they hit town man it really messed with everybody that's true. Because they understood that if you put yellow right next to blue, what that would what that would look like. Right. And, and what it did. I mean, if you've ever seen a Van Gogh painting in a museum, which I was lucky enough to see the Van Gogh exhibit years ago when it came to the National Gallery of Art. Mm -hmm. When we rounded the corner and that blackbird's rising from a field was the only painting in the room at the end of this about 30 foot room whole room's painted dark gray and then that painting it literally looked like the birds were just pulsing it looked like the whole painting looked like it was pulsing and I said oh my and I was the first person in there I was by myself I went oh my out loud about six people in a row right behind me including men came in with 
Oh my! I mean, that's the first thing you say when you when you see a Van Gogh painting on a calendar. It doesn't it doesn't compute, does it, Rachel? No, no. As to seeing one in real life, and that's that was yeah. their his his understanding and his genius was to understand what col colors made that painting move like that. Exactly. Um, and he used a lot of yellow. They say it's because uh, he had problems with his sight, but um, I don't know. It all it all works. It worked for him. It sure did. So um, again, I'm just kind of handling this a little impressionistically, just to see what happens. And if you look too at hydrangeas, they're not one solid ball. They're a bunch of little shapes within shapes, kind of like cauliflower. Think like cauliflower. It's got those shapes. And so you kind of want to think like that when you're painting them. And even if I left this just the way it was, you'd know that was a hydrangea, right? You'd know yes, it. it looks fabulous. But <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. But it's enough. And, and I think sometimes as painters, depending on how you like to paint, you don't have to get super, 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 super realistic. People can fill in the blanks, mm -hmm. and they like to. Yeah, they do. All right, I just mix some dioxazine, dioxazine purple with some of this raw umber mixture, which dulls it down nicely. Look at that color of purple. And I'll tell mm -hmm. you, this is a trick. I want everybody to try this. If you can make a little purple on your palette, I'm going to put some right here. And I'm going to mix a little green with it. And grab some of this green. Look at green and purple mixed together. That's beautiful. And it looks that, like it, this wall. Yeah, it's like a putty. It's like... It's like a putty. I don't mm -hmm. know. It's it's green, but I don't know. It's just beautiful to me. And it makes a great shadow color. Green and purple. I noticed you didn't put any black on the canvas, on the on our palette, Rachel. Why is that? Well, we don't need it. If you want to mix, you know, like we could take um, some of this quinacridone red and we'll even mix it with the raw umber. And a little bit of that blue. And there's, it's practically black, just like that. It's a little purpley though, let's see. Anyway, if you mix complementary colors on the color wheel, so like red and green together, you can get a shade of black. See, that looks almost black, but not quite. Yeah, it does. Add a little more red. And then add a little more green over here and you kind of have a dark, dark, dark brown. But um, yeah, a lot of artists don't use black. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It just can be a little strong. So you got to go lightly with that black. And if you can mix the majority of the color yourself, then... But I don't know, I just think uh, tonally it can be take over a painting. And mm -hmm. be, but that can work great if you're doing, let's say you're doing a real graphic painting. You, you may you may want that. I'm going to hold this down over here now and paint a little bit with you. Move all this stuff out of the way. Also, you might talk just a bit, of, like I was just looking at this right here, and I know one thing you talk about a lot in class is light source and where your light source is coming from. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, when I drew this arrow when I was talking about the light source coming this way, that's what I meant by that. And um, so see how the light mm -hmm. is hitting on that side and then everything's getting darker as it turns. So as something turns, um, the light will be lighter where the light source is and darker. And so we just want to indicate that. Now I guess if it was a totally flat sky day with absolutely no sun when I took that, maybe it would be flat all the way around. But, um, even when it's like that, even on a cloudy day, there's usually a, a light source one way or the other. And I think it makes the painting more three-dimensional. I think you're right. To, to show that. And your light source is... Coming this from way. this direction. Yeah, the opposite direction. And that's the thing about Leslie. She can just make it up. She doesn't even look. <laughs> well, she, I figure there's not any rules, so... There are no rules. I mean, didn't the Impressionists teach us that? No yeah. rules. Yeah. No rules. <laughs> um, did you know, I wanted to ask you if you knew this already, you, know, you always know a lot of artist facts and stuff, but I was reading recently that um, Leonardo da Vinci 
took 12 years to paint the Mona Lisa's lips. Would you what? The, yeah, would you have the patience for that? Well, hell no. <laughs> and let me just say that I, I learned about, and we talked about this in class, when I started learning and reading about glazing and how those guys would glaze, you know, an entire layer on, mm -hmm. then come back next year, glaze a whole nother, because I saw the uh, Leonardo at the National Gallery, mm -hmm. and it looks like you could reach down into her skin. It was so iridescent. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh my God, or translucent. Right. I was like, oh my gosh, how does that happen? And then Rachel said, because the glazing, uh, m miles and miles and miles of, you know, he, they would plant something and then they would glaze over and then they would let it dry because they had uh. no additives like we have today. Oh, no, they had so. to let it dry and take a long time. It took a dang long time. So, and the patience involved in that. But that's why, if you've ever gone to the Uffizi in Florence and seen Bronzino, do you know who he is? No, but I'd like his name. Yeah, no, Bronzino. It sounds like he's got a good tan all year long, doesn't it? Bronzino? Sounds like he has a Lamborghini. <laughs> He's got a Lamborghini. Uh, anyway, Bronzino does these this translucent scan like you're talking about. It is just, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It just makes me want to cry when I look at it, thinking, I'm never going to attempt that. <laughs> but here we are whipping out a quick painting that's fun, and we're having a great time, but I'm not going to spend 12 years on it. I guarantee you that. I don't know. Some people are just more patient. So I'm going to take some of this phthalo glue. Well, you glue. don't have to. You don't have to spend 12 years. Yeah. If they had had additives, they wouldn't have spent 12 years. Yeah, I wonder. Or if they were just, you know, they were perfectionists. You think? Extraordinaire. Yeah. Maybe. So this is phthalo blue with white. And see how bright that is in that. They didn't have girlfriends. Uh, yeah, they probably had no life. And then here's a little ultramarine. Even though they look the same, that's ultramarine, that's phthalo. They look the same, but man, you add white to it and you can see they are not the same at all. This is I'm glad purple. you picked out drangias because they're not as hard to paint as roses. Oh gosh. I know. Roses Talk about losing hard. your religion. Try to paint a rose. <laughs> uh, I have invented cuss words. Oh yeah. Although when people do them real loosely, they're really nice. I just love like this purple background against your green. Look, Look how it that. pops. I know. And did you leave that? Is that what's I left behind? it on purpose. I love it. But I might cover it up in a minute. Yeah. Leslie's so good. She is talented in everything. Well, way. that could be a reflection from your wall, Rachel, and you're saying things reflect into your paintings. That's true. Are you having fun painting? I also, yes, and I also, I mean, Rachel kind of gets, you know, she's like, oh no, sometimes when I do this, but like, I'll make up how that flower looks. If it doesn't look like, well, these flowers aren't dripping down like this, but I want it to drip down like that. Right. So. No, I, could, I love that. Make it your own. I like to make it like, hello. Yeah. Now you're good at that. You have a great imagination. Now she doesn't like it when you run it off the edge of the canvas. I understand that. I've done that. She's going to go back and repaint that. <laughs> Get that off that edge. That's making me nervous. <laughs> but, you know, she's right about it. Because I did go back and look at it, and it did look like it was going off the edge. I think it depends on the situation. Yeah. Some things going off work, some don't. Mm-hmm. So, let's see. We're not talking a lot about mixing colors here. Because we're just... I think I'm a process-oriented painter. We're just so playing. You. I know. Oh, you know what's... One of the exciting things about this is that we have a raffle mm -hmm. each time. Mm -hmm. And this next time, if people just answer a question, they put in um, what their favorite flower is and why into the comment section of the YouTube video down below. Okay. Then there's a randomly chosen winner and they get their stuff sent to them. and. Um, a really sweet school teacher from Virginia won the one from last time. Oh, that's amazing. And she loves it. She, she, and she sent a picture of a painting that she did. And it was I'm just happy beautiful. That a school teacher won. I know. Isn't that nice? Very nice. So it's really fun. And so actually, I am going to pull it out so we can show you what you're going to win. Oh, I love that. Yeah, there'll be a golden t-shirt because we're using golden paints. And it's got all the, well, I can't hold Here, it. let me hold it up. Okay, thank you. 
Mm -hmm. There's that. And then we were talking about the Masterson palettes. Right. And so somebody wins one of these lovely yep. things. Nice. And then um, we have Dynasty brushes as well. We've got a bunch of different ones and they will win those. And the Fredericks canvas like what we're using today, the Love red it. label. And these are nice canvases. They're yes, really, they are. They're excellent. How's your painting going? I like it. I like yours better, but I'm trying to kind of mimic what you're doing a little bit. Oh, yours is beautiful. Well, I love your texture. You know, I should have brought down some texture paste for you too. I don't know this texture paste. Well, it's kind of like that. When you add the texture, mm -hmm. it just builds up that body even more. One thing I want to say about, I wanted to say about Leonardo. We talked about him a few minutes ago, but did you know that his first skill was being a musician? That doesn't surprise me. That guy did everything. I know. He did he ever amazing. sleep? I don't think he did. He invented machines. He painted stuff for the Pope. He was everywhere. Yeah, he only invented, what, the airplane or yeah. <laughs> helicopters. So they tell me. Yeah. So, anyway, but I just think that's really interesting, like, that he's so talented in any of the creative arts. It's ridiculous. Like you. Um, no, I'm, I gave up tightrope walking. That's no good for me. <laughs> tightrope walking? That was no good for me. That didn't work. <laughs> Okay, so I've been having fun painting these colors that are, uh, they're just fun. But I'm going to try to do something that's a little more realistic right now by looking at this. I just want to test something here. I'm going to take a little yellow, a little white, and green. See that color? Mm-hmm. That's pretty darn close, right? Pretty close. And then... Let's just find a spot. What I love about acrylics is you can, if you don't like something you did, you can just erase it. Absolutely, it's gone. You can totally just repaint right over it. And in about 10 minutes, it's ready to go again. Mm -hmm. um, one thing fun about these angle brushes too, let me show you this small, let's see where is it? The small angle brush. You know that trick where you can take two different colors, like you can take the back end of a brown on one part of it. Mm-hmm. Like a toll thing. A what? Kind of like toll painting, isn't that how they do that? Do they put like a side part on one half of the brush and one half? See, that's cool. Look at that. Look at yeah, her. It's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a little cheating, but... I don't think it's cheating. It can just make something go a little faster if you want something to have a little shadow on it. So who is your favorite painter in the world, in the history of art? John Singer Sargent. Oh, gosh. Good choice. And what do you love about him? His uh, brush strokes and he's so, his faces are so expressive with just very few, you know, brush strokes. His, his workmanship is amazing. Oh, he makes it look so easy. Yeah, he does. But I agree with you. And doing all those loose brush strokes, I mean, way ahead of his time. Mm-hmm. People just weren't doing that that much. Well, Turner, but I can't remember the year of everybody at that point. Let's see. Well, Turner was really the precursor of very loose, abstracted work. He was amazing. Okay, look how cool this looks to do the white. Yeah, you're doing it. The white on top of the dark. That's another reason why it's good to go ahead and get your darker tones and just block in. And then when you go back on top, you've got this beautiful base that sets off your lighter colors on top. That's pretty cool. And let's say you've got this yellowish color. I'm going to take it down here and mix it with a little of that purpley green stuff I made. Mm -hmm. And that way, that is a darker tone of these leaves that's down here in the shadowed part. So where the shadowed part, where the light's not hitting it, you want to have your leaves a little darker. And that'll help create the rounded shape of the flower. I'm having fun. This is awesome. I've been looking to, forward to it for days and days. So have you talked to your husband about possibility of painting? Painting. 
Yeah. Will he ever do it? Have you no, ever? I don't think so. Well, I don't know. He might. But I'm trying he's to busy being a mogul right about now. He's got a new business. We have a new business called Obank Media Group. And we have a new publishing company, Indie Record Label, Digital Ooh. Distribution. So he's busy being a mogul. <laughs> I love it. He's a mogul. He's a mogul. That is so awesome. Good for you. Yeah. We, God just, has really blessed us. He's, he has been, he is, uh, my husband is extremely smart, thank goodness, mm -hmm. because I'm a creative and we're not always, not always the smartest people. We're creative and talented, oh. but, 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 you know, <laughs> managing a bank account now, there, there's a, that that's takes, a challenge. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And he's very, very good at all that. So I lean on him for that and he's, he's happy to take the reins of that and do it. And so he's, he's amazing. Well, that's pretty cool. Is this a? Does everybody know about your new business yet, or is this? Well, it's it's just um, it launches. We our our platform launches um, after the first of the year. We're busy right now building our content, and um, it's going to be amazing. So watch for it, um, and we'll be talking about it on Instagram and my website lessysatcher.com, um, and we will have our we have our own website, Old Bank Media. So all that will be happening sometime in the near future. Ooh, I cannot mm -hmm. wait. We're very excited about it. I can't wait to see your new office. I gotta get over there. It is swank, we love it. I did the whole thing with um, Goodwill Finds. Yeah. Ladies, you can thrift. Gentlemen, you can thrift. And that's what I did. And uh, had a very limited budget, but here I went to town and we had a good time. And everybody enjoyed it. We just uh, have really enjoyed it. That's awesome. We've done a lot of filming there as well. It's a great filming studio because it's got the walls colors are very dark and so and it's in Franklin right yeah mm -hmm. okay let's see what well you're a great interior designer too so good grief that's what I mean you're like Leonardo is there anything you don't do well no I wouldn't say I'm a good cook really no who does all the cooking over there mama and Jeannie mm -hmm. they're really good and Davey's a great barbecuer Ah, awesome. Well, I don't know what I'd do without my Curtis. He is an amazing cook. Yeah, he had it smelling good when I walked in here today. He was Curtis doing did. squash frittatas, I think they are. Squash pancakes or some such thing like that. They're, they're squash fried with all the stuff. Oh, they're like squash pancakes. They are so I good. I like that. Yeah. And he experiments. Nothing with the word pancake in it's ever hurt my feelings. <laughs> Who doesn't like that word? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I could do this forever. Let's see. How are we on timing? Um, we're doing pretty good. Well, my colors aren't the same as yours, but you have such a great color palette. I'm just trying to go around it. And see your if colors I can are fantastic. They're not the same as, look how dreamy your colors are. They're so dreamy. I don't know about that. But um, I am noticing these leaves, and I picked some up in the yard. By the way, side story, I don't know if you look at Facebook, but I posted this on Facebook because it was so shocking. I went out there to cut these hydrangeas, cut them with my hand, didn't think of the other, and then suddenly this horrible pain shot through my body. And there are these things called saddleback caterpillars, and it they have these thorn things all over them and it stings you and it's like a bee sting. Oh my word, and you got I, stung by one? Yes, and I thought, good grief, and called Curtis. I was like, I think I'm gonna die here. Of course I didn't, but um, if ever you go out to pick a hydrangea, please look underneath the leaves and wear gloves. You do not wanna get stung by this thing. Okay, Leslie, just for fun to show some detail work, I'm going to go in with a little liner brush. Just to like, I don't want to do a super detailed thing, but it's kind of fun to do this in some areas. Like, not overkill, but just some. Mm -hmm. I like that. I need a little more water, though. And I sometimes forget to dip it in the fluid medium. That really helps keep things moist, kind of like a retarder. And 
And I don't want anybody, to, I think we talked about this, not expecting to finish today in a complete painting, but I mean, you may. You're so fast. That is gorgeous. I'm just gonna keep going. Can I hold that to out stop? to show yeah. this camera? Look at this. Y'all, can you see that? Look how fat my picture is and how nice and skinny yours is. Oh, it's beautiful. And I don't know if you can see the texture, but there's a lot of texture too. That is gorgeous. Thank you, Rachel. Very pretty and so loose. Here's mine in process. Boop -a -doop. Looks amazing, as always. Well, it's in process. Always in process. You know, um, and if you're an oil painter, which I am, I love to paint in acrylic and do the base in acrylic and then go back over sometimes and do finessing in oil. Um, but you don't have to, and Leslie has the patience to get super duper detail with acrylic. Sometimes I run out of patience. All right. Do you have any jokes, Leslie? Do you have any? Uh, <laughs> anything? I was trying. I think I heard a good one the other day. I got told. I uh, forget what it is now. Oh, there was this. Um, these people were riding on this plane, and they were going along, and and um, started having engine troubles. Mm -hmm. And so the pilot comes on and goes, "Golly, we're having engine troubles! Quick, grab your parachutes and jump out." So uh, this guy grabs the first parachute and he said, I'm a, a, very, I'm a uh, world renowned scientist and everything I'm doing is very important. I have to have this parachute. I've got to jump. <laughs> uh, I've got to have this. Well, okay, you take it. So he takes the parachute and he jumps. And so then it gets to the next guy and he goes, hey, I, I have seven kids and a wife at home that depends on me and um, I've got to have this parachute. I've got to have it to jump. So he takes it and jumps. The other guys are like, okay. Well, it gets down to the last two people, and there's only two people. It's Pope, the Pope and uh, this young boy. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah. there's, now how does this go? It's Pope and the young boy <laughs> in the parachute. And he said, um, shoot, now I messed it up in my mind. Well, you'll have to edit that out. I can't think what it is. <laughs> That's how I tell the joke. The Pope, the Pope says, tells the, tells the young boy, I'm the Pope, you can take the last parachute. <laughs> There's only one parachute left. The Pope says, you can take the last parachute. You're young and I'm the Pope and I've already lived a whole life. You can go. And the young boy says, no, you go ahead and take. What? Why would that be? <laughs> Something's not right. Forget that joke. See, that's why I'm a singer, uh, <laughs> not a comedian. The people out there, they know the joke. Something about the little boy says, oh, the smartest man on earth just jumped with um, my backpack on. Oh, the little boy <laughs> says, the little boy says, the Pope goes, they're sitting there and there's, the, there is, there's one parachute left and the little boy's backpack is sitting there and the Pope goes, you take the last one. I'm old, I'm the Pope and I don't need it. You're young, you can live. He goes, don't worry about it, Pope. He goes, the, the smartest man on earth jumped out with my backpack on. <laughs> there's two parachutes. God. <laughs> That's Finally, hilarious. it came around to me. That took forever. It's People are going, don't quit your day job. Yeah. That was a good joke, oh, though. Oh, that is a good joke. There are people like Mac Davis that can tell a joke. He worked Vegas. That's not fair to compare me to Mac Davis. <laughs> I'm not. Oh, little side note. Who sang at our wedding? Leslie Satcher and Mac Davis Mac sang. Davis. And Leslie... And Mac wrote a beautiful song that when I heard it, I was like, oh my gosh, that's got to be at our wedding. And it was. That was a miracle. It was cool. We stood right by the Pied Piper who was playing the. Yeah, we had a um, bagpipe guy. It was cool. Scottish themed wedding. And then Curtis gets his DNA done and finds out he's mainly Norwegian. What? That's the first I've heard of that. <laughs> oh, yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> So now we got to redo the wedding and change our outfits into Norwegian. That's Vikings. hilarious. We got to be Vikings well, next. What about his name, though? His name is so Scottish. I know. What's that all about? Well, the Vikings came over there, you know. I guess. They pillaged and plundered and whatnot. And <clears throat> yeah. So <laughs> Scottish. You know, it's just like that commercial. What? What commercial? The commercial where the guys, you know, he's he's always they're always wearing kilts and stuff, and then they find out they're like <laughs> Norwegian. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's a commercial. Yeah, and they were Norwegian. 
Yeah, something like that. Oh, that's so funny. They have to get later hosen. Oh, they have to trade right, in their they're German. They have to trade in their their um their kilts for later hosen. That's hilarious. Uh-huh. Ah, anyway. Life is too funny. I'm not gonna get my DNA done. I don't care. I don't need to know. Although my brother and sister did it, so I guess I already know. Guess what? Scottish and Irish. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, it gets down to the last two people, and there's only two people. It's Hope, Hope and uh, this young boy. <laughs> and um, there's, how does this go? Hope and the young boy. <laughs> the parachute. And he said, um, shoot, now I'm going to see that in my mind. <laughs> the Pope the Pope says tells the tells the young boy I'm the Pope you can take the last parachute. <laughs> There's only one parachute left. The Pope says you can take the last parachute. You're young and I'm the Pope and I'm already living a whole lot you can go. The young boy says, No, you go ahead and take What? Why would that be? <laughs> Something's not right. Forget that joke. See that's what I'm saying. Uh, not a comedian. <laughs> The people right there, they know the joke. Something about the little boy says, oh, the smartest man on earth just jumped with um, my backpack on. Oh, <laughs> the little oh, boy says, it. the little boy says, the pup goes, they're sitting there and there's the, there is, there's one parachute left and the little boy's backpack is sitting there and the pup goes, you take the last one. I'm old, I'm the pope and I don't need it. You're young, you can live. He goes, don't worry about it, pope. He goes, that the smartest man on earth jumped out with my backpack on. <laughs> there's two parachutes. God. Finally, it came around to you. That took forever. It's... People are going, don't put your day job. Yeah. That's funny. Oh gosh. Okay, so mine's primarily green, 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 and I'm wanting to get. I'm going to go for just some white. Like I'm going to pick up just white. No yellows, no nothing. I got to see what happens here. Because acrylic will dry a tone darker. Have you noticed that? Mm hmm And I've also found out, and I love that, that you, when you put the, the, um, gosh, that looks pretty elementary. When you put the, um, the varnish on there, how, how oh, it makes the yeah. colors pop. That's awesome. I love that. Makes the darkers darker mm -hmm. and lighters lighter. You know what I haven't done the whole time is switch from this one brush. You've used like, Rachel's used like five professional brushes. I just picked up one and went to Holland. Look at you. Well, I mean, that's not necessarily a good thing. But this is a good brush, I might add. From. Yeah, it's a nice synthetic brush. Who's this from? No animals hurt. That is Dynasty. Black that's gold. Black Rawr. gold. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I just grabbed the black gold and went to Holland. Yeah. What's wrong with that, Rachel? Nothing. Nothing wrong with that. As long as you're cleaning the brush out every now and then. No. I don't want my brush I'll just run. keep going. I'm not ruining your brush. I've only had it for like six minutes. Mm. I do forget sometimes because I paint a lot with oils too. And I have to remember, okay, acrylic, you got to dig in there and make sure you clean deep into the spine, deep, deep, deep down so that it doesn't harden up. I hate getting a, having your brush all dried up. Yeah, this is fun. I love doing the thin layers. I'm kind of doing the thin white layers to build up the petals. That so is a nice when I was effect. reading about Leonardo too, I was reading about Michelangelo. And did you know the Sistine Chapel? Raphael wanted to do the Sistine Chapel, right? Because it was he was the it artist at the time, and and he thought he should get it, but. The Pope really liked Michelangelo's work. And why wouldn't he? And why wouldn't he? So, um, but Raphael decided to do reverse psychology with the Pope and everything. So he convinced the Pope to hire Michelangelo thinking that he'd fail and prove that he was a sculptor, not a painter, and that Raphael would look really good in his mm -hmm. eyes. Well, we all know what happened. Michelangelo <laughs> killed it. Michelangelo got the ceiling. Yeah, and he did an amazing job, and Raphael skulked away, I guess. But isn't that funny? 
been. It's always been professional competition. Always and everything, I guess. Falling stars will surprise you, baby, that's the trick. Gotta be ready like you've got nothing to lose. I just like complementary colors together. I love like pinks and greens and how they optically bounce with your eye. So next time, I have a surprise guest, by the way. I know who it is. It's going to be awesome. And um, old friend. Old friend. You mm -hmm. have to tune in. Amazing. Amazing talent. Yeah. I'm kind of keeping a theme of music industry people because we're in Nashville. And uh, a lot of people, I've learned over time, paint in Nashville. Like, they, they, they're really a lot of talented musicians that paint. I just find that combination really cool. So, if you are a musician in Nashville and want to come paint with me, too, let me know. Leslie probably knows a bunch. I know some. So I'll paint something and then the color just kind of gets, it goes away, darkens up so much. If I could just get one area with a lighter white, I want to see how that looks. I'm going to, I'm going to really put it on thick, see what it does. If you hadn't been a singer-songwriter, what would you have been? Artist. Did I went, you I was a, when I was in school, I went to um, visit a, um, a graphic design studio. When I stepped in there, this was in the day when they still used colored pencils and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. When I saw that stuff, I was like, oh, I'm doing this. This is what I want to be. Mm -hmm. And I, I tried that for a little while. Well, what happened? Did you um, take classes? I, I, couldn't, I, went to the, I went to Texas A&M, mm -hmm. and I was in the architecture school there, and I was um, killing the art classes. The math classes, not so much. What did I tell you about math? Not my deal. I mean, calculus, holy moly. Who invented that? The devil. <laughs> and um, so I just figured, you know, this is, I'm, I'm, I need to go home and regroup. I needed to go home. So I went home back to North Texas, where I'm from, to regroup. And while I was there, then I just, I thought, you know, as life would have it, your life takes turns. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I, I might just need to visit. I had some friends who lived in Nashville. Actually, um, Dwayne Allen from the Oak Ridge Boys. Mm -hmm. Though, that bunch, they were all raised together down where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And um, his nephews were already living. One of his nephews was already living up here. And he said, hey, come up and visit me. Why don't you? And I said, okay. So I did. And I got up here, and I heard myself in a recording studio. And it was like a drug. I went, oh, th th there you go. Ding, ding, ding. Purpose. So you had been a singer down there in Texas? Um, just, you know, just in school and stuff. I'd never been a professional singer. But you knew you had a great voice. Mm -hmm. I knew I, yeah, I was raised, my dad was a gospel singer. I was raised in church singing and whatnot. Wow. <sighs> that is cool. Well, now you get to live out both dreams because you paint. And I don't know if you have it on your website. Do you have your art on your website? Mm, no. That but, needs to happen. All right. Because you're good. Rachel's very complimentary. <laughs> well, it's true. I don't, I don't make this stuff up. So I tried that blue on there. I don't like it. You don't? Nope. I'm going to try purple again. Different type of purple. I don't even know what color I'm painting with. I just grabbed something. All right, right there. Okay, Rachel. Yeah. What's the most favorite thing you've ever painted, or what would you like to paint? Oh gosh, that's a tough question. I mean, you've been to Tuscany. That couldn't be that hard. The problem is 
to be honest there aren't enough hours in the day I want to paint everything I want to get everything you know give everything a go and and try it and um, like pretty much I think your next painting is always your favorite painting because that's how it is when you're writing songs is it really oh, yeah you you're convinced the song you just wrote is the best song you ever wrote period <laughs> well that's how I feel too because I feel like I don't know if it's the best but if it feels like you grow with everything you do right right so um, yeah I, like I'm, I'm about to do a couple of commissions and I want them to be the best paintings I've ever done and I'm not trying to be Pollyanna ish I, that's just I really do so but I mean when you talk about Italy I would love more than anything to go to Italy and really not just teach painting but be there to paint and have a sabbatical and just or Ireland you know and do nothing but paint for six weeks really nice like do an artist residency and I really want to be able to do that in my lifetime but as far as the subject matter and stuff that part is less important to me as just getting to paint and try new things and experiment with um, new materials and things like that 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 excites me a lot because you just never know where it's going to go. It's no. like Christmas every time. It is. Yeah. Um, I'm always kind of amazed when people are happy just to do the same thing over and over and over and over again. That's just not me. I like mm, to. I watch some painters online that do that, and I think to myself the same thing. Don't you get bored of doing that same subject over and over and over? Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. Right. But if you're real dedicated and let's say you're painting cows or something mm -hmm. and you've painted them every day of your life for the past 15 years and you keep finding new ways to paint them and new compositions and new I mean that would be amazing mm -hmm. I just I don't know I'm too curious about other things I guess All right, Rachel, as a professional artist, I think I might know the answer to this, but I'm still going to ask you. What is the number one challenge you feel as a professional artist? And I think if you don't answer this answer the way I think you're going to, I'm going to come back and answer it for you. As, <laughs> let me answer as Rachel. So do you want me to answer or you want to answer? I'll answer first, and okay. then you can say if you agree. All right. Marketing yourself. Mm. As a professional artist, isn't that mm -hmm. such a hard thing? I've heard you say that for years, how hard it is to market yourself. Yes, I agree with that. It's, there is creativity in marketing, for sure, um, but it takes a lot of time. And I just, when you're somebody who's creative and want, want to just focus on that, it's really hard to have to switch left brain, right bank, brain all the time and do all that work. Um, so yeah, I think Mark, I think you're right about that. Marketing is it's a hard yeah. thing. I've heard you just struggle with that for years, and I've, I've I understand it now more because as you know, as the COVID has really shut down stuff for for musicians, we have to learn to market ourselves in new ways. Mm -hmm. Not fun. It'd be fun just to go in and turn in your songs and be happy and you know all like the days of old. But right. those days are are that's completely different now. Yeah. You're having so, to reinvent the wheel, aren't you? Oh, yeah. And you're having to learn to market yourself. You're having to learn to, you know, reinvent how you do business, who you do business with, all that kind of stuff. That's a hard thing. It's very hard for creatives to switch back and forth like that. Mm-hmm. Right. One minute you think you've got everything figured out, and then mm -hmm. they change all the rules. Then the game changes. Right. And that happens all the time. That's just life. But it is, a, it is kind of can be very disconcerting at times. Well, technology has changed both of our careers. Oh, my big word. Way. Yes. So, um, I don't know, but what do you think is the mm, number one hardest thing to learn when you started painting? Color mixing. Really? Yeah, that's a very hard thing. That. Well, because it's, it is a, 
Uh, I mean, I, I've tried to do plein air painting. Boy, you better be a master color mixer if you're going to do that. Mm -hmm. Because there's no time to sit there and think, how do you make this color look like that <laughs> color? You, you don't have time for that. You have to just have an eye for it. Mm -hmm. And that is not easy peasy. That is not easy. So. Right. But that's one great thing about it. plein air painters. That taught me a lot about preparing and having your preset colors all done. Not what we're doing today. We're just having fun. But if you're really going to be serious about knowing your colors and your palette, it just makes life easier because you've got it all set up. You don't have to make that decision. Right. So next time we paint together, we'll do it that way. See how that turns out. Okay. But you're keeping a very, you know, you've got your palette. You don't, a lot of people, it's, it's harder for them to figure out what colors to use. And you're very instinctual. So you're much better at it than you even know. Thank you. Absolutely. I didn't even pay her to say that. <laughs> also, the rookie move of a new painter, like you, you're always telling us in class, you know, like, don't put the highlights in too soon. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's what you want to really get to the highlights like I'm doing now. You want to get to that. And mm -hmm. if you don't layer up, you know, and you don't put put in your background colors, you it doesn't matter because you color, you cover your highlights up. Mm -hmm. That's true. That is a rookie move and everybody does it because we want to get that zing. It's just so much fun. Yeah, that's the fun part. So I hope people that are doing this out there are having fun and just playing and relaxing and feeling the color and how it moves in your hand and what they do when you put these different tones next to each other, purple next to green, etc. And I think a lot of, there's a lot to be said for self-taught artists and I think just by doing is almost the best way to learn. To paint. I mean you can learn theory, you can watch videos, but just doing it and well an art is subjective too, you know. Mm -hmm. What we might think is not good or we might think is good, somebody else, you know, does like or doesn't like, so mm-hmm. You're almost done. No, it doesn't look good. Yes, it does. That doesn't look like yours. Look how soft and dreamy. Mine looks all heavy-handed, like some drunk. <laughs> <laughs> some drunk oh. carnival goer went, give me a go with that paintbrush. <laughs> now, what were you going to ask me, Rachel? I was going to ask you, when you're writing a song, mm -hmm. if you don't mind sharing a trade secret, mm -hmm. um, which comes first like the idea the lyrics or the tune or the the melody or how does that work well for me it comes at the same time now for some people it's that's it works differently for everybody but for me it comes at the same time when I touch the guitar I can hear the melody I can hear the words all falling into place at the same time Wow now that's that's, that's not the same for every writer uh, the, the different writers it, they you know, it comes to them differently, but that's how it works for me. Now you write a lot with other people, mm -hmm. right? So how does that work? Do you walk in going, okay, I got the melody and well, the some, lyrics? Well, uh, sometimes, especially when we're writing with new artists now, you want to write what, you know, some subject matter that they, they're interested in, that they want to, you know, that they might record. So you want to really be sure that you're, you know, reaching out to their, what's, what's interesting them or whatever they're feeling at the moment, you know, if they broke up with their boyfriend or they're in love or whatever. So I always just say, you know, what's what's going on with you? What do you feel like writing today? And sometimes they have an idea, sometimes not. You know, so I go with that. But um, uh, I, if I touch that guitar, the melody comes around. And so if they better hold on, because here we go. <laughs> and once we go, I don't slow down. I go to going, because that's what I'm put on this earth to do. And so, and that's one thing that, like Naomi Judd, a friend of ours, she was the, one of the first women in this town to ever look at my songs and, and talk to me about them. And she really coached me on, you know, length and how to, how to make a song professional because she had already been writing a lot of hit songs by then. And, you know, she was a, by the time I got here, they were, already, they were giant superstars. And so um, she helped me a lot with, 
with you know just listening to your own voice but but also learning to edit that's mm -hmm. what new new artists new writers have a trouble with editing mm -hmm. so and that's just a, it's a learned skill that's a skill mm -hmm. and once you learn it you got it and that's good but you got to learn it they don't know they need to learn it till they hear a great song by Dean Dillon or somebody like that and they go oh dang I need to learn. I need how do I write songs like that well learn to edit you know What would you say is the number one thing that you feel is um, important when you're working on a painting? Well, I agree editing is important too. So you, so you may have a plan and some people follow that plan precisely from A to Z. Um, I like to take side roads. I like to try things and be process oriented, but it's all about editing as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important. Um, I think the number one mistake that I see with new artists is this. I think they give up too easily. They don't get it the first time. It's, it's, they look at it and go, ah, you know, it's not what I wanted. And then they throw it in the trash. And if they would just put that painting aside, let it sit there, um, turn it around, and then three days later turn it facing toward you again, and then look at it again and go, oh, okay. There's some elements there I can work with. That needs to go. This needs to stay. There's the editing. Mm -hmm. and, but they just don't get the patience. They don't have the patience for it. And I keep saying, you know, be gentle with yourself. You're just learning this. You, it takes a long time. Yeah. I mean, you've only been to art school and all kinds of stuff. Well, yeah, but even that, I mean, like the other day, I, I sit down in the morning. You know that I was doing a large trip tick. It's 11 and a half feet long. And that's a lot of real estate there mm -hmm. that you go look at and examine you're looking at the broad picture then you're looking at the overall color the shapes the, you know you're, and then you're getting down to details so i keep a notepad and i just have a cup of coffee and i sit there and i make notes and i uh, decide what needs to go and stay and how it goes and then that's the editing i do and then i make all those changes then look at it again the next day so it just keeps happening so you have to be patient patient and it's, I don't know, do you have to be patient with song? You like oh, my word. Well, let me just say there's a great songwriter named Bob McDill who wrote, um, uh, oh, he wrote Amanda, Waylon Jennings. He wrote, he wrote uh, Good Old Boys Like Me. You remember that great, great song? Oh, yeah. He wrote some of the greatest country songs of all time. He would work on a song for a month. I mean, that just was his, that was his deal. That was his style. That's how he, that's his process. That, I could, I could not do that. I, I work on my songs for about two hours. And if they don't come around in two hours, I'm on down the road to something else. But not him, McDill. He, he understood about, you know, just waiting for the, the right. He would tweak and tweak and tweak and work and work and work on it. Now, that, I, I could, I don't think I could ever do that. And he did it. Wow. He was a great songwriter. He's also in the, I mean, you you think who who's the who was right? He's in the Songwriter Hall of Fame, you know. So right. Who's your favorite person that you've uh, written for or with? Right, that's um, probably a hard question, isn't it? Because you've done a lot. One of my favorite people to write with is Vince because he is um, he and I have always been on kind of on the same page from the very beginning. We we instantly were like brother and sister in the writing s session. You mm -hmm. know, it was very very we had there was a lot of like we'd known each other our whole lives and he's always been like a brother to me mm -hmm. been very important in my career and um he's recorded i mean we've probably written over 20 songs he's recorded all of them but one wow so i mean he's 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 been very you know he's been very good to me mm -hmm. he's he's one of my favorite people to write with because he's not he's not a um i don't know we just have the same style yeah and we come from the same part of the country a lot of that is just you know kind of being being from the same area and stuff like that you know mm -hmm. understanding you know i understand his people right i grew up around people like him he's a lot like my own cousins so yeah that that's true i mean being from the same part of the country that's interesting i never thought about that mm -hmm doesn't mean automatic tick, tick, ticket that you're going to like somebody, but no, it doesn't. You may understand them a little bit. Oh yeah. Huh. 
we've always had a really great writing relationship and and a great friendship and he's been I could never ask for a better friend than, than Vince has been to me. Well, when you wrote Troubadour, I always wanted to ask you, like, how did you feel when you got that phone call about Troubadour being picked up? Well, I was really excited, and I'll tell you, I had, uh, George on that album had already recorded three, three songs, or two songs, but he hadn't recorded Troubadour yet, and we were really waiting on the Troubadour call. And we were like, oh no, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? We didn't know, you know. And it, we, I was getting nervous. And um, when they called and said, he's just recorded it, I about had a heart attack. Because <laughs> I knew it was for him. We wrote it for him. His producer, Tony Brown, asked us to write that song for him. At, told us what kind of content George was looking for. Because people at that time thought he was retiring. He wasn't mm -hmm. ready to retire at that time. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to say, I'm not ready to retire. Mm -hmm. And so we really sat down and pointed that lyric and everything straight at him. And I mean, people say all the time, do you write specifically for people? Yes, sure do. I've mm -hmm. written specifically for Reba and she's recorded it, bless her. You know, so mm -hmm. I've written specifically for Willie Nelson and he's recorded it. So um, mm -hmm. I've been very blessed in that. Now, some, sometimes it doesn't work, but sometimes it does. And when it does, it's a huge, huge blessing. Right. Was You Remain the one you did for Willie? We Nelson? wrote for Willie, yes. Oh, that's my, my favorite song of yours. My friend said, if you could, you know, if you could write for anybody, today, who would it be? And I said, Willie Nelson. And he said, well, you know, we can't get a song to Willie Nelson. And I said, oh, yes, we can, too. I was recording my first record for Warner Brothers, and uh, Mickey Raphael was playing harmonica on it. And I said, we'd take it straight to Mickey. And if he likes it, maybe he'll take it to Willie. And that's exactly what happened. Wow. So, wow. We were super blessed where that was concerned. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. I like it that you didn't say no. You're just like, oh, think of a way. Yeah, no. There's always a way. Mm-hmm. So, one more question, Leslie, and then I think we got to wind this baby up. All right. But... You know, I know that when I'm painting, I get super lost in my thoughts, and I have all kinds of amazing experiences where, where I don't know where I, my brain goes, but I, I just love to get lost in painting thoughts. And um, But I wondered, with you, do you do that, and d does it ever help your writing as far as music goes? When I'm painting? Yeah, when you're painting. I forget to stand up when I'm painting. If I'm sitting down, I mean, I literally have to make myself get up and leave the easel or whatever because I get so engrossed in it and don't want to leave and all that. Um, and I listen to music while I'm painting a lot so I listen to different things that things that I don't normally like I listen to a lot of Julie London and people like that they're you know not really people that I you know not my not where I've made my I don't listen to George Strait I love George Strait but it's not I listen to different kinds of music to help inspire mm -hmm. me to to write different types of things. Oh, that's so I get lost in that. Mm-hmm. Well, that's cool. That is a good answer for you. That is a good answer. I mean, I when I get really lost, I mean, I forget. I could be up there five hours standing one spot. Oh, I know. And all time disappears. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of scary. I'll be like, oh my gosh, it's dark outside. And I started at, you know, <laughs> one. <laughs> right. And so you have to almost set an alarm to remind yourself to go drink water and Go for a walk. So, I would love, speaking of that, just to continue on and on and on, but we're just going to have to show them what we did in, let's see, what did we do this in? About an hour and a half? We may condense some of Look this. Look how pretty yours is. So is yours. It's hers is so delicate. Mine's always so heavy-handed. Leslie, you know, who you are shows up in whatever you paint. <laughs> oh, and no. I'm not saying you're heavy handed. You're heavy handed. No, you're strong. Uh -huh. And there's a strength in your paintings. Look at that. There's a strength of Mark. There's a confidence. You just lay color down and it's gorgeous. Thank you, Rachel. That's stunning. Look at that. Thank Holy you. cow. How did I get that roundedness? Oh, that is so beautiful. Thank you, Rachel. And um, I do think your whole personality and life kind of show up in your art. Look how delicate hers is. Well, Isn't that beautiful? This know. looks so Tuscan. 
but I'd like to do more on it and we'll just show everybody where we got and then hopefully we want you to send us what you did too in an hour and a half and we'll just have fun and have a little art show I'm gonna do a little blog and if everybody else send us their stuff so um, I want to tell everybody to please subscribe to McCampbell Art Studio that would really help me a lot and tell your friends if you like these videos mm -hmm. painting with friends mm -hmm. and we'll be having more Nashville folk coming on to paint you could get some of your friends to paint at your house together with you while you paint with Rachel yeah. that would be fun I know like have painting a parties party. absolutely. absolutely they could drink wine at their house I know <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We can't drink because we oh. got to wear a mask. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, we're so glad. I'm so blessed you guys joined us. And I can't thank Leslie Satcher enough. Thank you, Rachel. Enough. Thank LeslieSatcher.com. Look at her music. You'll want it. You'll want every CD <laughs> she's ever made. She's an amazing talent and um, painter, too. I think this needs to be on your website. Okay, I'll put it on my website. Okay. And Instagram is? Leslie Satcher. At Leslie Satcher. Okay. Mine is at McCampbell Art. Mm -hmm. Pretty close. Well, right. thank you again. Thank you, Rachel. I love, love you. you. <laughs> love you too. Yeah. That's a good one, Rachel. Right behind the sun, you might be surprised to learn there's a million falling stars just waiting their turn. Dreamer, don't give up Keep your eyes on the sky Or you'll be looking up Some dark midnight Here it comes Make your wish quick Falling stars will surprise you Where you are Just go on and